five best lessons from Jocko Willink on leadership skills and how to apply them in the workforce. When it comes to leadership skills, who better to learn them than from a Navy SEAL? You see, the Navy SEALs, when they go out and they go out to fight for their country, when they go out to, when they go out to be deployed, one of the things that, the conditions that they work under, everything is a do or die situation. If they make one mistake, if they neglect something, if they are negligent, they themselves or one of their team members could die. And so when it comes to being deployed as a Navy SEAL, one of the most important things for them is to have solid leadership skills, to lead their teams, and also for their team members to lead up as well. So in this video, what I want to share with you are the five best lessons from Navy SEAL Jocko Willink on leadership skills. And I'm going to also show you how you can apply them in the workplace. Let's go. Lesson number one, extreme ownership. This is when we, like this is when you, take extreme responsibility for holding up, for being able to be a leader, for getting to the next level that you desire in your career path, right? This is about not blaming others for anything at all. Like for example, you know, sometimes we are working in the workplace for our company and we might say something like, well, I wish my boss would see me as more than just a pair of hands. Or maybe we might say something like this, well, I wish my team members would respect my leadership instead of going behind me. Or we might say something like this, I wish my company, right, the leadership and the executive teams of my company would see my value and therefore offer me opportunities for a promotion. Whenever we say something like that, inadvertently, subconsciously, we are putting the responsibility on other on another person. Now Ojaka Willink says that extreme ownership is that means that we do not blame other people, that we take responsibility for it all. So for example, the first one I gave, if we were saying to ourselves, well, I wish my boss would see me as more than just a pair of hands, extreme ownership would then say, no, it is your responsibility to demonstrate that you are more than just a pair of hands. And so therefore, if my boss did not see me as a pair of hands, that means there's something that I'm not doing. There's something that I'm not stepping up into to be to demonstrate the true value of what I have to bring. So so lesson number one is extreme ownership. When you take extreme ownership, it means that you are taking responsibility for solving the issues at hand. Whether or not you perceive the problems, the issues to be there, or they are real issues for the team and your department as well. And when you take extreme ownership, it means that you are in control of the things that you're in control over because you cannot control what other people think or you cannot control other people's actions, but you can only control your own. And this is what will give you the biggest sense of control over the environment and over your career path as well. So that is lesson number one again. Once again, it is extreme ownership. Lesson number two, managing up, right? This is the hardest one. Managing up means that you take the lead, even though you may not have be in the position of leadership right now, or you may not have that official title, but it is still within your responsibility to manage up, to lead up. And what does this mean? Leading up means that you, with your knowledge, your expertise, your skill sets, right, your demonstrated value in the company, this means that you are communicating your perspectives. Ask questions, right? Figure out where there are points of communications that are lacking. Figure out where there is information that they don't yet have in order to make decisions that are in your favor or decisions that you believe that is necessary to make in order to move the mission forward or the company's vision forward. Right? And if you feel, for example, that your boss isn't quite providing you the support or if they are not providing you the opportunities for yourself or for your team, then first of all, right, don't blame others, blame yourself, which goes right back to stream ownership. And the next thing you can do, once you take extreme ownership, the next thing you can do is convey your perspectives. Ask questions to see where there are information gaps that you need to give in. Where is Where are some information, where, where are some pieces that you can convey that you haven't conveyed yet or clarify some things that have not been clarified yet in order for your boss or for your executive team or the leadership team in that department to make a more informed decision. Where is that? And so that is your responsibility. Examine what you can do to better convey information so that the support can be allocated to you and so that opportunities can be given to you or that you can be invited in important meetings. Now, if you are somebody who wants to take your career to the next level and you want to know, how do I do that? How do I even convey that information? And, and you understand that communication is the most important step. And if that is the piece that is missing for you and you want to know, how do I improve that? What do I say? If that is you, then I invite you 
to book a call with me right below this link below the video in the descriptions there the first link in the descriptions is a link to book a call with me and my team and this is for me to coach you to guide you on how do you develop those communication skills how do you convey that information very clearly and succinctly to your boss so that they can support they can allocate the support to you so if you're serious about taking this to the next level to get that attention to get that promotion and to get that position in leadership then i invite you to book a call with me and i'll see you on the inside lesson number three is commander's intent Right. Within the Navy SEAL, there's a leader, right? And the leader conveys their mission to the rest of the team. They convey the goals that they want to meet as a team, as a Navy SEAL team. And it's really up to the field, right? The soldiers in the field, the other Navy SEALs that are under him to be able to carry out that mission. But the thing is, so they understand the intent of the commander. That's why they call it the commander's intent. The leader has conveyed the goals already and the team members are to innovate so that they can carry out the mission. And so when they go out into the field, wherever that might be, when they go out into the field, they must make decisions on their own because the leader is not always with them every step of the way, but they are commanded, right, with the intent, they are commanded that this is the mission we wanna carry out, the overall mission. And the mission is conveyed very clearly to the team members. So when they're out in the field and let's say the leader is not with them, they have the freedom to innovate, the freedom to make decisions, as long as it aligns with that commander's intent. And so therefore, in the end, do or die situation as the Navy SEALs are in always, they meet the goals that the commander sets forth. So how does this apply to the workplace? Commander's intent, the intent is from your boss, or the intent is from the executive leadership of your company, right? Or maybe the department head, right? You have these commander's intent and they have a goal and a mission for you, right? They hired you for a reason. They hired you to solve a one important core problem of the company. There's a reason why you were hired in the first place. So what is that commander's intent? When you understand that commander's intent, then it is your mission, just like in the Navy SEALs, you're going out in the field right you are the field worker you're going out in the field you are to carry out this goal so understanding this means that you can innovate you can make decisions based on what is the commander's intent and this is when as you take action to meet those missions to accomplish that goal this is for for you to be able to reflect upon the outcomes and the results of your actions and the decisions that you've made are were they good decisions did they move the company did they move your teams did they, did they move your department closer to the commander's intent right so you are constantly assessing the value of the questions you're asking and you're constantly assessing the quality of the decisions you're making as you take action towards that right so that is lesson number three which is commander's intent by the way, if you are learning something, if you have some breakthroughs or some aha so far, that is great. You are expanding your knowledge base, but knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is power. So I want to hear from you. Take action, participate, comment below. What did you learn so far from these lessons? Right. And also at the end of the video, right, share with me what have you learned from the remaining two lessons as well. So make sure you comment below because taking action is participating. Taking action is what solidifies your knowledge. And also, if you liked what I'm saying, you resonate with it and it's helping you to move your career to the next level, then remember to subscribe to my channel. Give me a thumbs up. Ring that bell below so that you can receive a notification every time I release a new video. Lesson number four is default to action. Right. Most of the time, whenever we're in a situation where there's a high level of ambiguity or maybe in a situation where we don't have all the information or we don't quite know how everything's are going to play out, the default is to wait, right? The default. No, most people, they wait to see how it plays out. And when you wait to see how it plays out, there's actually greater suffering for you and there's greater suffering for, for, for your teams as well. Here's what I mean by that, right? When it comes to the workplace, you're gonna be making decisions all the time. And most of the decisions, like 99.9% .9 of the decisions are in an environment where there's a great degree of uncertainty or ambiguity because that's not how life works, right? You can't know everything before you take action. It's not possible to know how things are gonna play out. So if you're waiting to see how things are going to play out there's always something new that's going to happen right so if you wait 
it's going to be greater suffering for you and the situation could turn, could turn out worse right for example if you there is if you're making an important decision like deciding whether or not to fire someone or let someone go on your team right because they've become more of an expense or more of um, more of a, of a liability on your teams that's a really difficult decision but waiting until how to see how it plays out could cause more suffering for you and your team members and your colleagues as well and your managers that are depending on the team to move forward right so decisions like that right when you wait it turns out to be a lot worse so that's why lesson number four is default to action this is where you got to make decisions you got to default to action in other words make taking action your default instead of waiting your default because waiting is a default that is more in a comfort zone whereas making a decision and action as your default is more empowerment and just know that there is a power in within us in when it comes to being resourceful resourcefulness is your greatest superpower when it comes to moving the mission forward of your company commander's intent right moving the mission forward right being able to innovate and make decisions and act according to what the mission was that you were salt that you were hired for right that default in action will cause you to be able to elevate your leadership, will cause you to be able to manage up, it will cause you to be able to take extreme ownership. When you are resourceful, trust that resourcefulness, right? And this is when, if you know you are committed, if you are truly committed to do what's in your best interest and also what's in the best interest of your team, it can't be just in your best interest. It must be both in your best interest and in the best interest for your teams, the best interest for your boss, the best interest for your company as well. If you know that to be true and you're committed that it is a mutual best interest, and that is your moral obligation, your ethical right, then you can trust your resource, trust your resourcefulness, trust your resourcefulness and default to action. So that is lesson number four, is to default to action. Lesson number five, lead follower let's face it you are watching this video because you want to be a leader in your industry you want to be a leader in your company and you want to be recognized for the leadership qualities that you want to exude right but here's the thing every great leader is also an astute follower right when it comes to leading in the workplace no one person can be a leader a hundred percent of the time there are going to be times and situations where you are going to be the follower even the greatest leader in your team right now or in your department right now will be at some point a follower as well because in a particular time and situation it could be another team member has the particular knowledge or the experience to be able to lead and sometimes that might be you, sometimes that might be somebody else. So that is why great leaders are also astute followers. But two of the greatest of the key behaviors of an effective leader, there's two key behaviors. The first one is to constantly be reporting progress. And that goes back to extreme ownership, right? Not blaming other people, but taking responsibility, holding yourself responsible for solving it, right? So that is reporting progress. And the second key behavior is understanding that you are in a, this dance between leader and follower and to be able to accept leadership from those where the time and situation calls for it. Right, so those are the five key lessons from Jocko Willink on leadership in the workforce.